The fall season of 1977 has had the general authorities encouraging the membership of the church to become more involved in missionary service. As part of our Saturday evening session of state conferences, we've shown the fil film, Go Ye Into All the World. The film has presented President Kimball instructing us in our missionary responsibilities. His vision as he explains the growth of the kingdom has touched me deeply. In the film, he states, the Lord will place in our hands inventions which will almost be impossible for us to comprehend. And who can say what other miracles the Lord has prepared for us? Each time I hear these statements, I am thrilled with the vision of our prophet. In a reflective mood and thinking of what words he has instructed us in that great film, I was reading in the Doctrine and Covenants the other night in the 88th section, and these words stood out to me. He comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, and all things round about him. He is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him and of him, even God forever and ever. And again, verily I say unto you, he hath given a law unto all things, by which they move in their times and their seasons, and their course is fixed, even the course of heaven and the earth, which comprehend the earth and all the planets. I marvel as I am privileged to study of God's dealings with mankind, of how remarkably he's paved the way and provided the means for his children to learn of his ways. I would like to walk you through just a brief period of history today with the objective of showing you how the Lord has prepared the way for you, the most advanced generation in all times, to assist him in this final stages of his kingdom building process. The scriptures have recorded the story of God's dealings with mankind for centuries. The Old Testament deals with the history of the Hebrew nation as it records the preparation of the world for the Messiah. Starting with low, scattered notes, it expands as time passes with enlarging cruci crescendo into clear, loud, trumpeting tones as the approaching king. Meanwhile, God in his providence is making ready the nations. Greece is spreading a common language throughout much of the earth. Rome is making one empire out of the whole world, and the Roman roads make much of it accessible. The dispersion of the Jews among nations paved the way for the gospel of the Jesus Christ. The Savior came to a world with limited opportunity for travel and communications. Cities were located on waterways of seas and rivers, which afforded the best means of travel. Transportation by water had developed from the log to the raft, the canoe, then on to the sailboat, which offered the best means of moving great distances. Land travel was difficult with only a few roads, oft times dangerous. Most of travel by land was by foot, sometimes with the aid of domestic animals, such as the dog, the horse, the donkey, the ox, and the camel. Equally as difficult as travel problems in keeping the gospel pure and undefiled was the problem of communications. Picture writing had changed to alphabet forms. Clay, rock, and metal tablets had given way to papyrus and parchment. Can you imagine how difficult it was to operate a church in those days without our modern means of transportation and communication? My heart cries out to those early apostles as they sought to build the kingdom, realizing the problems they were facing. Just take the example of Paul as he left Ephesus, as is recorded in the book of Acts. It states, and Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia, 
For he hastened, if it were possible for him, to be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Then he instructed the people thus, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made, hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them. And they wept sore and fell upon Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. Then they accompanied him unto the ship. I can imagine what it was to leave those people, realizing that just one or two times would be your only opportunity of ever visiting their countries and their places and their branches of the church. The period of time between the preaching of the gospel, following the Savior's mission and the rest, restoration of the gospel, little progress was made in travel and communications. City sites were still on waterways. Travel by water was still the best means to go great distances. Domestic animals was, were still the main source of travel over land. Dramatically, just before the beginning of the 19th century, it was just as if a bright light was turned on to illuminate the minds of mankind. After almost 1,800 years of sluggish development, suddenly the field of transportation and communication moved forward with a new and exciting pace. In the fields of communication, in 1803, a machine was perfected for making paper. By 1814, a cylinder press was developed. In the field of transportation, 1787 saw the first steamboat come into being. In 1804, the first steam railroad locomotive was constructed. The Lord was preparing for the establishment of the gospel again on the earth for the last time and starting for the preparation of the return of his son. This time, the restoration was to be permanent. A support system would be developed that would keep everything in place. A means of transportation and communication would be established just before the growth of the church to keep it nourished as the word of the, of the Lord was revealed to his prophets and his children. The history of the growth of transportation and communications is exciting to me as I study its development as it parallels the growth of the church. Review with me this remarkable history and see if it does not give you an added witness of God's dealings with his children as he prepares to spread forth his gospel to all parts of the earth. On December 23rd of 1805, a son was born to Joseph and Lucy Mack Smith in a small insignificant place called Sharon in Windsor County, Vermont, as the Lord prepared for his prophet to be an instrument in his hands and in effecting the restoration of the gospel, the growing of printing and transportation continued to proceed. In 1822, beginnings were ma made in photography. In 1828 marked the publication of the first American dictionary as technology was carefully placed to support the introduction and restoration of the gospel, so a prophet was being carefully prepared and groomed for the role he was to play. A portion of his story reads as follows. Sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the, this place where we lived unusual excitement on the subject of religion. It commenced with a Methodist, and soon gen became general among all the sects in that region of the country. Indeed, the whole district of the country seemed to be affected by it. 
It created no small stir and division amongst the people, some crying low here and others low there, some contending for the Methodist faith and some for the Presbyterian and some for the Baptist. The clergy contended, in order to have everyone converted, as they pleased to call it, let them join what sect they pleased. But yet when converts began to file off, to some, some to one party and some to another, their seemingly good feelings one for another, if they ever had any, were entirely lost in a strife of words and a contest, contest about opinions. I was in my 15th year in the midst of all these war of words and tumult of opinions. I often said to myself, what is to be done? Who of all these parties are right? And are, are all of them wrong together? If any be right, which is it? And how shall I know? Then he recounts that remarkable reading of the first chapter of the fifth verse of the book of James. Joseph's inquisitive mind led him to retire to the sacred grove, and the story unfolds in that spring of 1820 we all know so well, of his remarkable call that prepared him for the restoration of the gospel. Through t though tested and tried during the next few years, he remained strong enough to be worthy of being entrusted with that sacred and holy calling. Following the call came the delivery of the plates and the translation of the Book of Mormon. Now all was in readiness for the organization of the church. And on the designated date of April 6th of 1830, Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, and members of the Smith and Whitmer family met in the home of Peter, Peter Whitmer Sr. in Fayette, Seneca County, New York. After appropriate songs and prayers, the revelation concerning the organization of the church was read to those assembled. These revelations set forth the order of the priesthood and the duties of the officers of the church. Around this pattern, the entire church organization today has been built. According to previous commandments, the prophet Joseph Smith called on the brethren present to know if they would accept him and Oliver Cowdery as their teachers in all things of the kingdom. This was approved by a unanimous vote, following which the order of the church was followed, where Joseph ordained Oliver an elder and Oliver ordained Joseph to that office. The sacrament was administered and those who had previously been baptized were confirmed members of the church and received the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Some enjoyed the gift of prophecy and all rejoiced exceedingly. Immediately following the organization of the church, missionary efforts pressed forward. Oliver Cowdery and Peter Whitmer were called to take the gospel to the Lamanites. A great desire was expressed by two recent converts to accompany them. So Ziba Peterson and Parley P. Pratt were also commissioned to make this first distant missionary journey. The first extended mission was one that was designed to influence the church for many years as it proceeded after the conference held in April, uh, in September of 1830. The mission of these four men caused them to travel on foot for more than 1,500 miles to the west. Parley P. Pratt had previously lived in the vicinity of Kirtland, Ohio, where he had been commissioned as a minister for the Campbellite faith. One of his first stops on this missionary journey was to return to Kirtland. There he thought, uh, sought out Sidney Rigdon and preached the gospel to him. He had been his former pastor. He received it, and the congregation was receptive to the message with the, which they brought to them. By the time they left, they had a thriving branch of 20 members who were in succeeding weeks able to bring into the church practically all of that religious group. The beginnings were underway. The stone was beginning to roll forth. But with the growth came opposition. The prophet moves the center of his operations from Ohio to Missouri and then driven to Illinois. By 1840, 12 stakes had been organized, one in Ohio, one in Iowa, 
two in Missouri, and eight in Illinois. By the, the time had come to expand the work then over the great waters. 1839 saw members of the newly called Quorum of Twelve Apostles preparing for missionary assignments. The expansion created a need for better travel and communications. The Lord was already preparing the way with new and advanced technology. Morris was developing the first telegraph system in 1837. The first crossing of the Atlantic by a steam-powered ship occurred in 1837. In 1838, the railroad had started to grow in the United States, and by 1840, there were 2,818 miles of track. Then opposition struck at the very heart of this new church. The newly called prophet was illegally imprisoned. On the 27th day of June of 1844, a mob stormed the jail, and his life was taken. After the death of the prophet, Persecution became so intense, again it was necessary to leave their homes and journey into a barren frontier. Under the leadership of Brigham Young, members of the church moved forward across the Mississippi and on towards their way west in the epic pioneer trek. Of the almost 70,000 who attempted the journey, about 9% of those were laid to rest along the way. A tremendous loss for a young, struggling church. Again, the Lord's hand is evident. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed near Promontory, Utah in 1869. Now the church had 100,000 members. The organi organizations of the stakes had to start all over again as they settled in the West. At the completion of the railroad, eight new stakes had been organized in Utah, one in California. By the turn of the century in the 1900s, the membership of the church had grown to 270,000 in 43 stakes, 28 located in Utah, 13 in other parts of continental U.S., and two outside continental U.S. in the colonies in Mexico and Canada. The demands for better communication and transportation continued to grow to be able to visit and travel to the growing number of members in the sc st uh, scattered stakes was necessary. Technology continued to keep pace. In 1885, the first transoceanic trans cable was laid. In 7 1876, a message from Bell to Watson introduced the telephone. In 1895, Marconi sent the first message by radio over the great distance of about one mile. 1889 saw the development of the first photographic film. 1894, the first motion picture projector. And the late 1890s, the first automobile came on the scene. Technology and church growth continued to parallel each other. As the church approached its 100th birthday in 1930, the membership was now over a half million in about 100 states. 61 located in Utah, 35 in the balance of continental U.S., and four located outside continental U.S. Innovations continued to sp supply needed requirements to nourish its growth. Between 1915 and 1920, long-distance telephone was instituted among major cities. The first commercial radio station came on the air in 1920. Transportation continued to become easier and faster. The automobile, the railroad, and the steamship expanded their service. This period also marked the beginning of air travel. 1903 saw the Wright brothers make their first successful attempt. The first commercial airline service started at the beginning of the 20s. By 1928, the United States, in the United States, we had routes covering 14,155 air miles of passenger service. While it required 100 years to organize the first 100 stakes, during the next 20 years, the church added the second 100 stakes. The membership now exceeded 1 million. This was the period of rapid church expansion in western United States. 48 of those new stakes were still formed in Utah, but now more than half the number are 51 
were formed in the rest of continental United States, and only one additional was added outside continental U.S. Only one half the time was needed to establish the next 100 states. By 1960, the number had grown to 300, and the membership had grown to 1,700,000. The new Utah stakes accounted for 34 of this third hundred organized, with another 61 in other parts of continental United States, and now five outside continental U.S. This period marked the first organization of stakes overseas in New Zealand, Australia, and England. The leadership and financial base had been established in the United States for the growth and expansion of the church throughout the world. The Lord continued to prepare for this expansion with new technology to support its growth. TV, airline routes, and Pan American established the first jet overseas travel to coincide with ex exactly with the organization of the first overseas stake. The computer came into existence and technology pressed forward so that the worldwide expansion could be accomplished. It was now possible to go to and from far off places and communicate with a worldwide organization. The 1960s saw the growth of the church worldwide. During this decade, the number of stakes doubled the number organized in the previous 10 years. 200 stakes were organized during the 60s. The membership was now almost 3 million. Of the new stakes organized, only 20% were from the state of Utah, 62% from the balance of continental U.S., and 18% outside U.S. Now let's look for a minute into the future and see what will occur in the church growth as we add up the results for the decade of the 1970s. By the time the church reaches its 150th birthday on April 6, 1980, my personal projections would have the church membership over 4,500,000. The number of stakes organized will be about 1,225. Only 10% of those stakes organized during the 70s will come from the state of Utah. 45% will be from continental U.S., and an equal number, or 45%, will now come from outside continental U.S. Of the total number of stakes we'll have at the end of the 70s, 31% will be outside continental U.S., 43% in continental U.S., excluding Utah, while Utah will account for 26%. What a dramatic change occur, has occurred since the 60s. What a miracle is also occurring in the, this period in communications and transportation. Within minutes, we can contact any part of the world. Within hours, the most distant stakes can be visited. As this remarkable growth continues in the decade of eight, an 80, in the 80s, a whole new set of challenges will be offered to the church. If just one half of our percentage growth continues, the membership will almost double during the next decade. The number of stakes outside continental U.S. will equal more than half of the total number of stakes we have. Now I am privileged to stand before a group today which the Lord has selected to be the best trained of all of the children He sent to the earth. He is making the largest investment in you He has ever made in the history of the world. To, pr pr to produce his future leadership base. Our review of history this morning has demonstrated his hand in the establishment of the organization of the Church today. Most of the support structure in building has come from resources outside the Church. Now, with this tremendous investment he's making in you, I wonder if that will not shift, and he will expect more to come from this great institutional center here. I wonder if the Lord will not expect you to carry a greater load in supplying the technology to sustain the growth of His kingdom here on earth in the years to come. Could I suggest just a few problems that we'll be facing in the next decade? First, the problem of language differences. As the Church expands worldwide, the mix between English-speaking and other languages continues to change. How inefficient it will be if we do not discover better ways to communicate. 
Second, the problem of training new leadership will almost be overwhelming. Most of the leaders in quorums, wards, stakes, and, and other places in the church will be first-generation Mormons. The problem of training them and having them effective in leadership will be enormous. Third, new and less expensive means of communication must be developed for the distant stakes, missions, and regions and areas. And we must find these to continue the growth. I'm sure your fertile minds can think of many more. I am encouraged with what I see in beginnings around this school. New discoveries are made, made, being made and worked on in ener energy sources. In this city, new discoveries are being made to use the computer to increase our learning capacity and our learning capability. This university is wrestling with the problem of language differences with some exciting results. These are beginnings, but I know the Lord is expecting more. What will your contribution be to make the return on the investment he is making in you here in order that the church can continue to expand as it grows worldwide? May God grant you the vision to see the potential there is within you that you may become part of a team that will build and sustain the growth of his kingdom here on earth. Now I know his hand is guiding and directing us here. God still stands at the helm. Jesus is the Christ, and Spencer W. Kimball is an instrument in his hands today to bring about this remarkable growth of his kingdom on earth. May God bless us that we may embark with great enthusiasm in accomplishing that which he would require of us in building his kingdom, I humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.